Hello everyone and welcome to the Break the Game Alpha Edition number 7. I'm your host Dominic or Shadow Fury, whichever you prefer. And we are getting started right away with the quarterfinals. It's going to be a bigger tournament than it was last week because we actually have a tournament this week. Not... Sparkling's a bit of a wild because card to be honest. I'm not entirely sure where they're going to be coming enjoy, on this. But this week we have a proper tournament. So that is how it's going to be. Well, guess we'll find out. And... We are going to be starting out with Nautical Yurt a bit of a wild card, to be Shadow honest. Murder. I'm not entirely sure where they're going to be coming in on this. Hmm. Well, we'll find out. Nautical Yurt and Shadow Murder Lock, both reasonably strong players. I think that's probably the most even match, or one of the most even I matches. Know. Sparkling's a bit of a wild of card, to be honest. Available. I'm not entirely sure where they're going to be coming in on this. I am really excited to see oh, what's going to happen on this, because they are both very strong players. Or sorry, they're, they're reasonably strong players. That was my that was my whole story. They're reasonably strong players. They do a pretty good job with all this thing. In case you're wondering about the song, it's a it's an OC remix version of a Castlevania Three song. Just yeah, there's someone in chat wondering about that. So or kind of in chat wondering about that. That is what is going on. So, Nadevoyer and Shadow Murloc. Shadow Murloc is a pretty cheesy player. Nadevoyer is fairly straightforward, but Shadow Murloc is a very cheesy player. we got to keep an eye on what Shadow Murloc does, because they like to do the weird stuff. They like to do the stuff that you don't really see a lot of players go for quite as much. Like, not cheesy necessarily in the sense of going for the obvious things, but more like they seem to... They've often, in my experience, found ways of really just exploiting openings or finding ways of taking advantage of whatever exists. So cheesy is maybe not the best word. Creative might be a better word. Still, they are starting quite aggressive, going Legion Legion Ether right at the start. Well, not if your goes for a pretty typical setup with fast expansion. Fast expansion and altered though, no tech for them. Not off the bat. Is not if you're going what are they going for? I mean they have the early Zentari, but they're going for the early ether, but they also didn't get a fast expansion, which unless they're worried about getting attacked by something, which to be fair, is an, is a fair concern. There has been a fair there has been a lot of like worker pull harassment going on not out of the ordinary. I just would expect Shadow Murloc at this point. They've got Orzum, they've got Centauri, they're clearly going for the center of the map. They might be going for something like just get early Pyre. A little early for a pillar, but you get another Legion Hall, you push further from there. No, it's really just early map control. Really make sure they get that early Pyre. We Keep an eye out for a timing attack then. Keep an eye out for, you know, four or five minutes into the game, what Shadow Murloc does with this Pyre. That's going to be a very important part of the game. Just the fact that they did take... They took that pyre. They are going around grabbing... What they can. They did go early harass... And, or early aggression. And now they're going for... Somewhat early tech relative to their opponents. It is much earlier tech. Not about your... Altars up. Their bone stalkers are up. They do have... A reasonably strong army to work with here, but then Zentari are kind of busted these days? They're, they're a little strong. They're a little overtuned. That's a little, little, maybe a little quick. We're not entirely sure of the specifics, but there's a... There's no real call for Nautavoyar to try to push in and attack them. Shadow Murloc going for map control. Okay, they are not that is that is going to help them capture this eastern side of the map. I mean, typically you go for a third here and then fourth here, and then sometimes you go for a fifth here. Often you just go here instead, and the alloy only. And switching over to Zephyrs, Shadow Murloc doesn't seem particularly starved for either resource in the moment, but none of your again they have the advantage of alloy. 
don't really have the advantage of ether. But still, advantage of alloy. Disadvantage of army. The map control is clearly proven to be a bit of a challenge. They still have an extra 20 power in the main base with these two turrets. So those are likely to be the target next. And there they are. Yeah, not if we were right as I say that. Goes to take out both the neutral towers. Give themselves a little bit more pyre to work with. Especially as all the camps in the main are, or the map, are just about taken out. Waiting on those to refresh. Mm -hmm. Not of yours. Kind of just going. Now, Shadow Murloc does have... Oh, they have a position they can work with. Are there any Neurocytes? Are there any Neurocytes? No, no, there are not Neurocytes! Getting very early thrums, but these Bone Stalkers have nothing. They have no way to hide. They have no way to fight effectively besides trying to kite. And with all this efforts here, that is not happening. The Bone Stalkers are not in a position to do this. Not a Voyeur holding on to their pyre. Doesn't want to commit for infuse. Doesn't see the point of putting in Mark Prey. Wants to hold on to it. They are they are able to do great hunt. Or very soon we'll be able to do great hunt. Not the most useful yet, but if Absolvers come into play or Hallowers come into play, it will be a thing that Not of Warrior is gonna want to have hold, held on to. Is Not of Warrior going No, they're not going mess uh, Bone Stalkers. A lot of times you'll see Bone Stalker into Resonant. Although Thrums were threatened and are being built. Yeah, it hasn't been uncommon to go Bone Stalker opening into Thrum for Harass into Bone Stalker Resonant. And then Bone Stalker Resonant into Colic. That's a reasonably common open or reasonably common route through the Zoltec tree. Alright, it's a reasonably common route through the Aru Tech tree, regardless. It's in both cases, Master Hunter or Bone Stalker. Both of them kinda they fill roughly the same rule, so that's the same idea. Not a voyeur. Currently ahead on Pyre only because Shadow Murloc has expanded and built up. And indeed is going for this as their as their fourth, in fact. One of the three o'clock is their fifth. They are not making it clear where they're expanding, but they are making sure that they have full vision everywhere. Building towers even by their opponents alloy only. Apparently prompting Not a Voyeur not to go for harassment with the thrums. Going instead for using them as a support force. And i -Course as well. I was... This is new. This is a shift. It makes sense. Thrums are very ether expensive. Like, again, oftentimes you'll see Thrum as a harass force, like, three or four of them. Was five, but that's really expensive. But yeah, three or four of them, and then after the Thrums do their business, then you just have Resonance follow up with Bone Stalkers. This is not that. This is a very anti-light fast harass force. Just overall. This entire thing. There's like... Neurocyte is up, so we could be seeing upgrades for stock. We could be seeing... We could be seeing residents, but probably not. We're going to be seeing upgrades very likely coming soon. You see, here's the thing, is that these are all not light units. The Icors do great against the Zentari, but once they get up against the, the Zephyrs, it's not the same thing at all. This is with... This is with the Mark Prey. Like, this is what the damage bonus Mark Prey gives you. The Zephyrs are kind of an even match for this composition. And to be fair, it's you know, between that and Great Hunt, 175 Pyre to take out a significant chunk of your opponent's army. Not the worst deal, but really, that was... That was alright. That was okay. Like, not about your... They saved up that pyre, they used that pyre. Their opponent is building a lot of towers. But the pyre is the same. They are roughly even, and Nonavoy are continuing to push Ikors. Ikor, Thrum, Bones, they are they are going to ham on this entire idea. They do not want they got Ikor speed as well. They are committed. They want to make Ikors work, and I mean I'm here for it if it can. It's just a bit of an uphill battle through the Zephyrs. We do have possibility of turrets. We don't have anything for the Angelarium yet. Like, the Angelarium is up, but we don't have any 
we know the Aravaro is the bearer of the crown, so just some Angelarium stuff. Basic things, Sentinels, Scepters. Neither of them has been really deployed. Okay, Scepters are on the way. And this entire run by and gets a couple. That's that was worth that was worth it. Just from the cost of rebuilding alone. One Zartar to take out two modes is absolutely a valued proposition f in favor of Shadow Murloc. Okay, not of Oyur. They do realize their opponent has a lot of anti here, right? Like, this is not build thrums to get anti here. This is. This is a strange setup. Like I said, they've upgraded Ikor speeds. So they definitely want the Ikors. And that is currently the only really generally considered useful upgrade. The, the stabilized upgrade to create slow is not or like create slow zones when you stabilize. That I don't see people ever use. And I can't say I'm surprised. It's, it's a weird move to use. You've got to you have to make sure to have all the Ikors positioned just right, and then they have to stay there for a few seconds and. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to be tweaked or what's going to happen with it. At the moment, it's not very popular. Anyway, we do have the Thrums coming in here. We do have I mean, Icors trying their best against the Zephyrs, but again, this is not a great matchup for the Icors. Thrums is doing an okay job, again, with the damage bonus thanks to Mark Prey. But if they can get rid of the Scepters, then that's going to be a nice little position there. Again, Nanda Foyer does manage to take map control and some pyre as a result. They have enough for yet another great hunt, should they so choose. Mimas here as well. Shadow Murloc is looking to rebuild. They are rapidly rebuilding. They're getting more scepters, more zephyrs. Again, this isn't on paper a really good composition to deal with non voyeur They just aren't. They just aren't. So that's that's been a bit of a thing. It's mainly Mark Frey has been the biggest part of that. Well, that being said, not of where's ruck it luck is running out. The ruck is running out. I I did sleep last night. I swear. Their luck is running out as they are being pushed back. And they don't have anything that's anti-heavy. I am honestly surprised they're going this hard on Icor. This is the first round is best of one, by the way, so if this. If this doesn't work for Tottenham Voyeur, they are going to lose this bracket. And I mean, in fairness, they aren't doing too bad holding the line. It's just they have the resonant tech. Although they are low on ether, that's the thing. They're building a lot of. They're using the ether to build a lot of thrums. But the thrums are kind of countered. They're using their ether to build a lot of. I or alloy remaining to build a lot of icors, but icors don't do a great job against zephyrs. Again, resonance. Resonance would have made a lot more sense. Like, Resident Ikor would be okay. Ikor Thrum is just, it's countered by Zephyrs. No, Mark Prey, again, it's helping. It really is helping. It's the only thing helping, but Nanavoyar is just out of pyre. They're, they're done. Even the power getting back from killing the marked units, it's just not working. I really... I really want to know, I'm going to ask them after the game, why did they not build Resonance? Because Zephyrs are heavy units. They do not get taken out by light units. Shadow Murlocked able to take out Nautavoyer's third. And they are basically running Roughshod. There's, there's nothing here. Nautavoyer trying to come back, getting some Bone Stalkers in. If they're upgraded, then maybe if they have the Ambush upgrade, that'll help. But they're not stopping to stabilize, which means they probably don't. Now the fourth is going down as well. The nine o'clock expansion is down. Worth noting, Mur Shadow Murloc has basically taken everything but their third. Not if you're continuing to try with this composition. I get, I get, I get the the ether requirements. It's just that thrums aren't really helping at the moment. And that's, like, two thrums for ether cost is one resonant. And four resonants compared to eight thrums would be a lot more effective at dealing with the Zephyrs. 
Unless they're worried about Sharu. That that might be what they're thinking of. But then, well... They're, like, yes, that's a thing to worry about. But that's at that point, you'll have Red Seers and Akalox. You'll have... You have Aerox. Like, you have ways of dealing with Sharu. Not a voyeur. Undeterred. Moving forward, try to harass out as best they can, which is the appropriate use for this composition. Like, that's why you build what they've built, is if you want to just take out a bunch of worker lines. Uh, they are now, once again, forced to deal with their opponent's army. Trying to escape back up at their main base. They don't have a lot of room to do so. Losing a significant chunk of their army in the process. Now the rest of it moving up. Oh, half their units just gone on the way uphill. And now Shadow Murloc has the height advantage. They can see down. They shut. Not a warrior cannot see up. Appropriately enough. They just don't have much of anything. Not a warrior is down to 32 blind, down to 1400 alloy or alloy equivalent army value. They have started rebuilding their third, which is good. That's absolutely appropriate. It's just they don't have the units to deal with this stuff. Getting Zakal's also a good move. Zakal's will also help deal with his efforts. I pointed out Resonance because they're a bit more immediately effective, and then when you start dealing with, say, a wall of Fire Singers, Resonance are a very useful tool. As it stands, the Zakal's are up. And for those of you who just joined us, the opener's the kind of curious. Well, Shadow Murloc went Legion Hall Ether Expo. They went for early Zentari to get Pyre. While Nadvoyer went for a early expansion. Early expansion, I think it was Expo Alloy or Expo Expo Alter. And then they waited a bit for Alloy. They got a bunch of bone stalkers and I think it was Expo Alter Alter, Alter actually. It took a while to get to tech. They didn't even build a Neuroset before they built a Godheart. Uh, they were really committed to getting early thrones. But didn't really harass with them, which is usually why you go for early thrones. Uh, moment of truth. Zakals are in the army. Worth noting, Magi are light units. Icors are not useless. They just... They're not going to be as useful as, say, Zakals for dealing with the Bulk of the force. Parsing is there, main army's there. Sharu are on the way anyway. Because of course they are. Now the call's pushing in here. Pillar dropping as well, just to provide that little extra bit of support for Shadow Murloc's forces. Not everywhere has no pyre left. They burned a bunch of it on well, they burned the last of it on the Mark Prey that give it six seconds. Give it three seconds. They'll have another Mark Prey up. So I'll likely use immediately. Still, it's this is tough. There's the arm the amount of units is the problem. Not a voyeur, unfortunately for them, they were throwing a bunch of money into thrums, which the Zephyr's already countered. And that gives Shadow Murloc the win. So congratulations, Shadow Murloc. You have taken the game. Now we are going to be moving on to the winners semifinals. I think I'm going to want Actually, not, to... Uh, Sparkling's a bit of a wild card, to be honest. I'm not entirely here. sure where they're going to be coming in on this. Oh, let's still find out. Yep. Actually, I'm not... Sparkling's a bit of a wild card, to be honest. I'm not right, entirely so sure where Santa they're going to be coming in on this. Shut them or luck. All right. Oh, let's still find out. And also need to deal with things. Actually, I'm not... Sparkling's a bit of a wild card, to be honest. I'm not entirely because sure where they're going to be coming in on this. That's a thing that I've been doing. All the streamers have been doing. It's how people get into the oh, game now. Find out. Which, I guess, is nice. Actually, I'm not... Sparkling's a bit of... So, we are going to be moving on to... Santa versus Shadow Murloc.
which I guess is fine because Shadow Murloc's already here. And Nanavoyar is going to be fighting against Spockling in the Loser's Bracket match. Oh, Lick 3. Oh, hey, Lick 3. That name is very familiar. So, to explain the nature of the game, it's definitely based on StarCraft. Absolutely, it's based on StarCraft. It is. It was initially developed as a mod. Oh, it's a product of a bunch of mods for StarCraft 2 because that's the honestly the easiest thing to mod. And I say that as someone who has worked with the Spring Engine, I'm aware it exists very much. So it is hard to work with. I'm sorry. It really is. StarCraft 2 is a lot easier to work with. So the mods were based on that, and as a result, some of the early factions play a little bit more like that. Not to mention the factions in Vanguard are a bit more varied, but yeah, at the moment, definitely has a lot in common, but it does do its own thing in a lot of ways. The Pyre abilities with the Immortals are much more like Age of Mythology, actually much more like Command Conquer Generals, Age of Mythology, Battles of Middle-Earth, it's a lot of abil like global ability type things, and the... And overall, like, it's... I guess it's kind of like StarCraft in the way that you have expansions with workers, but that's about it. Like expansion with workers and units that fight that are standing to shoot and you micro them by just repositioning them. It, I know it's very vague, but... But we are... I'm... <laughs> admin stuff. Anyway, we are... If the game is a... It's definitely not designed to be played the same way. In the sense that StarCraft 2 is much more of a plate spinning exercise a lot of the time. It was deliberately designed that way in a lot of ways. Whereas Immortal is specifically designed not to do that. Which I know sounds like a bit of a weird thing to talk about. But yeah, RTS is kind of in the past that way. So with that, yeah, Immortal Gates of Pyre is much more focused on just building up the right things rather than focused on having like enough barracks and constantly building your workers and constantly getting like doing the cycle around the thing it's the workers build automatically they have to upgrade bases to get the thing the the units build all kind of at once rather than one at a time the economy is built around similar lines though like it is still built around having you know two resources one that's kind of a basic resource you generally collect one that's tech resource so minerals and gas are an analog to that to the way pyre or the way alloy and ether work but yeah and a lot of the specifics is very different but i suppose broad strokes you could say it's like starcraft but then broad strokes so are many games so yeah it i think chat i mean dude in chat mentioned it depends on what you compare it to it really depends on what you compare it to or how you compare it but yes it is definitely the same family of rts it's definitely the same subgenre of rts that is occupied by starcraft and warcraft and kind of command and conquer and especially generals it, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly good design, honestly. I think there's... It gets a lot of flack because StarCraft has the plate spinniness that generally gets looked down upon. But it's overall a solid formula. Anyhow, with that, we have a... We have our game opening. We have Santa Claus going for early Legion Hall. I mean, they're playing Orzum, which means they're probably going to go for early Legion Hall. Or early Legion Hall Zentari. They were playing a little bit of this. They're playing some mean builds earlier today to practice for the tournament. We're going to be able to see those on stream now. <laughs> it's... Now, something to bear in mind. Shadow Murloc going for the early expansion first. So if they hold this off, they're going to be at the advantage. It's a matter of holding it off. Always is. Though, Shadow Murloc... Oh, I'm backwards. Shadow Murloc's going for the Quick Legion Hall. Santa Claus is going for the early expansion. So, if Shadow Murloc can't break this down, 
then Santa Claus is going to be a little ahead. I, I mean, Santa Claus is not the only one expanding. It's, that is one thing about the dynamics of the early game. You don't, you lose some time in your expansion, but you don't not expand. Like, not expanding would mean building two altars and, like, eight Centauri and just going for an immediate kill. This is more just making sure you get some higher while you're building up. Which is what Shadow Murloc did last game, too. The exact same thing. Santa Claus, on the other hand, not really worried about that. I mean, as a Jari, they want Pyre for towers, obviously. They'd want Pyre for Deliver from Evil sometimes, if they're going for run bys and harasses, which, Santa Claus being Santa Claus, they likely will. But they aren't needing it in the same way as Orzum does for the Pillar. Heaven's Aegis costs 150 Pyre. Or, no, is that? Yeah, 150 Pyre. And it's... It is... A... It is a late game ability. You want to use it when you have a large army. You don't use it early on. Pillar, you tend to use earlier on because it really powers up Zentaris because it gives the range on top of the DPS boost that it just gives for being the pillar. And later game, your opponent can just burn the pillar down immediately. Early game, it's a huge amount of damage. Does it stand? Santa Claus? Getting themselves prepped for a little bit of a run by early on because it's Santa Claus. That's what they do. It's the gift that keeps on giving, is Santa Claus's harassment play. They don't, however, have deliver from... Oh, no, they do. Never mind. They have deliver from evil up. 50 pyres, what you need for deliver from evil. I keep forgetting it was 75 at one point. But that was when it was also overpoweredly big and teleport radius. So yeah, they can get out of here whenever they like. These, these Sapari, you know, the moment that they get threatened, yeah, they can just run. Or they can just run. Like, they don't even have to teleport. They can just run. They can literally use their little legs. Their little angel-infused legs. It... Look, it looks little from the top-down camera perspective. I realize they're probably eight feet tall, but... Eh. There it is, though. Shadow Marlock going for that quick pillar push. Considering that there's that run-by over here, that's definitely... Position. Though Zentari still here to defend Shadow Murloc. Realized Santa Claus would try to take advantage of the attack to go and run the back, and they did. And Shadow Murloc was prepared for this. Getting rid of two production structures immediately. Santa Claus, I think, is what? One Legion? Yeah, one Legion Hall. So any units that die cannot be replaced until production structures are built to replace them. No, oh, this is also best of three. So that's gonna be Shadow Murloc able to take out a base. Because, again, Sapari are coming in. They just can't build more of them. That is the risk of frontline production structures. If they get hit, you... Because, of course, that's the other thing to bear in mind. Another difference here. It is a... It is a lot of... There is merging supply and production. You can't... You can't... You don't have to do the supply build either. So, yeah. Oh yeah, Lick 3, it's new from Zurka, that's right. And, yeah, this definitely follows the same design principle. Well, similar. So, I have a point of contention with 0k, and I have a point of contention with... The, it's not just 0k, it's actually a few games. There's a shift... I, I noticed a shift sometime in the early 2010s towards accessibility within competitive games. The one that I tend to point to is Skullgirls, but 0k is another example of this, where the game has a bunch of stuff which streamlines things that were obvious mechanical issues like obvious like just deficiencies in what the players are expected to do without actually adding much depth so trying to get like trying to cut that fat but only in the sense of like mechanical strain not in the sense of the actual baseline game, and instead the game was designed to compensate for this. So Zero K in particular, you had things like line move, and you had the fight AI, which does, like, it's reasonably okay at microing itself. And you had the 
fact that production was entirely automatable. But at the same time, the whole game was designed with that in mind to still be quite challenging to play, even when it came to things like micromanagement, was still a lot of work to do. You just were doing it, you had really good tools to do it with, but you're still doing a ton of work. And you're still like, you still have to deal with stuff in a very minute way a lot of the time, just to be able to play the game properly. And it feels kind of weird, and it's just... It's like, it's designed to make up for the accessibility by making things way harder, and honestly harder to grasp ways, because there are ways that relay more interaction. And anyway, basically, speaking of interaction, Santa Claus going for the counter attack here, pushing right into Shadow Murloc's base, and Shadow Murloc, they have a reasonable defense, but they cannot hold the pyre control. And that's the key thing, Shadow Murloc's going to struggle to get another pillar from here. They got a pyre camp, but that's about it. They're still short 30 from a pillar. And Santa Claus looking to set up around the side. Going to go for another push over at the 12 o'clock, are we? Looks like no. Oh, it looks like yes. They were just delaying a bit. Wanted to regroup. Going back in. And that is going to prompt the expenditure of Pyre from Shadow Murloc. Empire Unbroken just to give their units time to regroup. Of course, they don't want to lose production structures if they can help it. This, once again, Santa Claus is seeing, or poking, checking if there's an opening. Empire Broken is on cooldown, regardless of the pyre cost. So that's a, f that's basically a free legion hall. Santa Claus also expanding at the same time the Shadow Murloc has expanded. Still relatively... Shadow Malak's slightly ahead on bases, and Santa Claus was forced to rebuild an expansion. This aggression from Santa Claus is largely just to keep Shadow Murloc from growing out of control, given the early advantage Shadow Murloc had. And that is going to be... That is a lot to go f to fight against. I mean, Shadow Murloc... Again, they're ta they taking advantage of their economy and just rolling with it. No real tech switch coming from Santa Claus. They're continuing to go for the standard tech. They do have the Angelarium if they want to get some, some Wardens up, but against this force, I wouldn't recommend it. They could go for some kind of tech. They are getting a fair bit of ether. It's just... Yeah, they can't really push much of that, can they? Absolvers would be okay in this situation, but then you gotta worry about Windstep on top of them. That's a tough situation. Like, Santa Claus is definitely on the back foot. And Shadow Murloc continuing to push in. Making this reasonably effective. As I push. At the very least, getting their map control back. Getting another expansion on top of that. Getting a third- double expanding! Off the back of that counter push. Single, single Sapari up in the base, but a Single Centauri waits for it. Expectedly. Expectantly. Shadow Murloc well aware of Santa Claus's proclivities to run buys. And more importantly, well aware of the fact that Fool's Bay is a map that has this center ancient. Which, yes, looks like a weird Sharu thing, but that's... The placeholder model. It's a center ancient. And that gives Shadow Murloc all the pyre they needed, honestly. Like, mentioned before they had a pyre deficiency. Well, yeah, that's been reversed. That's no longer the case. They are perfectly fine. And more run buys, more attacks. Anyway, back to the discussion. So the thing with the thing about Zero K is that it is very accessible compared to it's pre like this is why, again, I identify this most strongly with Skullgirls, a fighting game that came out in 2011, which was more accessible than its contemporaries because it was the main way it was accessible was that like fighting games have this thing about certain inputs are done by you know doing certain motions on the main stick with your character and then hitting a button. Skullgirls made those a lot more consistent and a lot easier, but still had things like 20 hit combos they had to learn. But the combos were more consistent, like you didn't have to worry about a bunch of things that would normally make combos weird to do. It's a lot to get into, but it made it a lot more consistent and easier to practice, but it was still, you had to know 20-30 hit combos. You still had to understand that your opponent was going to 
like, try to intentionally drop the combo to mix you up. It was a lot of little things where it's like, the game is as hard or harder, despite its, regardless of the accessibility things. It's not really accessible some in the same way. It's just, like, relatively. And that's why I say it's that period. Because after that, we kind of went, okay, well, this is what that does. And then you get into a game like this, where there's more of a push on accessibility by way of actually thinking about what are the meaningful strategic decisions, and how can those be as impactful as possible. Like, just not worrying about making the old skills matter as much. Not worrying about making the mechanics matter as much, and actually going, okay, what can we do to make the underlying game underneath the mechanics matter while keeping enough of the mechanics that is fun, but avoiding the stuff that's tedious and avoiding the stuff that leads to frustration. Which, again, is a very, very 2020s way of handling accessibility in game design. Where the 2010s tried to preserve mechanical complexity while smoothing out the edges. Or, if it streamlined things, compensating in other ways by making the game just a lot more a lot. 2020s design has been more trying to find ways of trusting that the player is going to have fun, even if the mechanical side of the game just is simpler. Like, make the make the interactive side more the focus. Make the strategic side more the focus, which is, is an interesting choice. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. Like, from the fighting game side, Guilty Gear Strive does this absolutely. And the, in the strategy game side, Immortal Gates of Pyre is definitely striving for that. I think it does strike a good balance for what it's trying to do. I, there is still a lot of little things you can do to improve how your armies fare in terms of micromanagement. There are some things you can do for macro management just for consistency's sake. It's easier to make up for falling behind, but it's still not a good idea to fall behind. And the biggest thing, however, is just the micro is more important, and that's the thing that's more directly fun for most players. And then multitasking comes from just you often want to go for harassment and run by because you have a little bit more band attention bandwidth. Okay, Santa Claus going ham on to the 9 o'clock expansion. This this expansion is basically done for. Shadow Merlock, are they going to go for a counterattack? Are they going to try to trap? Oh, they're going to try to trap. They forget Santa Claus is playing a Jari. Although, Santa Claus won't be able to tell to save all these units. Oh, the trap. Oh, wow, Shadow Murloc taking full advantage of the position. Perfect concave coming in here. And while the Sharu are here, they are too little too late. Shadow Murloc able to dodge out of the way. And that is going to be a significant loss for Santa. Like, half their army value just went down the tube. Lost a couple Sharu as well. All of their army villagers went down the tube. Santa Claus throwing in the towel for game one. Shadow Murloc taking it. And that is going to be game one for Shadow Murloc. Very well played then. Oops. There we go. Back. Very well played by Shadow Murloc. And that means it is up to Santa what the next map is. Also, congratulations, Nangert, on getting a key. You have now received your key. Alright, got that sorted. Yeah, I mean, accessibility is a transitional thing, because again, it all comes down to what what do you think is going to be fun? And, of course, like, pre-even 2000s, games were designed in a way that was honestly limited by the tech at the time. Like, a lot of the things that you see, the way that StarCraft worked, the way that the old fighting games worked, the way that a lot of the stuff was built out was just so much they could do, or trade-offs they made about what resources they had to work with. And that's less of a thing. But then, of course, those games are built in a way that had a particular playstyle, which people got attached to, for good reason. You know, it was still skills they learned. So, the transition from that 
came out from, well, let's try to think of what makes it hard for new players to get it, which went from what new players were complaining about at first for things like, it, it, I need to select more things or I need to be able to do, like motion inputs are harder, like really, really basic things, but not thinking about, okay, but what actually makes the game, what would really smooth the learning curve? Not just what would make it easier to get into at the very, very, very start, but what would really smooth the learning curve? And it took, it took a good decade to figure out, to go iterate from just figuring out how to smooth out the beginning to figure out how to smooth out the whole learning curve. And also get get buy-in from the players that this is actually the way to go. Like this is actually a, a fun game that still retains depth. That that is a huge that was a huge, huge burden. And in the strategy game space I'd argue it's well, it's hard to say if it's a burden or just a matter of taste. I mean, arguably, StarCraft 2 did the same thing. Like, if we if we discount mi macro mechanics, StarCraft 2 did the same thing of trying to simplify and streamline things in the way of making sure that the stuff, like, the really basic interface level quality of life was addressed, but without actually addressing the stuff that makes the games really frustrating to deal with. Oh, we started did not tell me. Yeah. All right. My bad. We are Orzum on Mala. Shadow Murloc and Santa Claus continue. So Shadow Murloc still Orzum. Santa Claus version of Mala. Going for a very, very, very early altar. Double altar, in fact. Double altar, then expo. So when I said aggressive builds are going to be like double early production facility, double tier one production facility. This is what I meant. Santa Claus is demonstrating this exact thing. And that demonstration is making Shadow Murloc's life a little bit more difficult right now. They do not have a lot. They have three Zentari, which are somewhat damaged. More Mass Hunters are on the way. There should be another set. Yep, three more coming. Not a full eight. Still something. The towers to point out towers do activate at one minute and 45 seconds but mostly those just santa claus being careful with their positioning to avoid getting hit by them and that is santa claus are they gonna take that out i don't know they're taking out zentari after zentari that legion hall oh i don't think empire broken's back out of cooldown yet and it's not Nope, that is Shadow Murloc losing their early Legion Hall. Still have another, but they cannot rebuild. They are lacking the supply count. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, for the design thing, like, the skill ceiling question, like, what is the skill ceiling was the question that needed to be answered in a meaningful way. Like, what defines skill ceiling? What makes the thing worth playing and investing time into? And that, again, is still a bit of an open question as far as the current crop of increasing levels of accessibility. Like, it, this really is going to be an experiment answering the question, is it, does it require complicated, involved mechanics that require a significant amount of practice on the player side in order to be fun? Shadow Murloc able to defend this, no problem. Santa Claus able to recover from this, no problem. They have their expansion up. This... Harassment did slow down Shadow Murloc's attack. So th this is pretty much a dead heat now, as far as army value, supply value, everything. They're they're about on par. Production buildings do not auto-build units, but they do provide supply cap. Like three. The way that production works in Immortal, which is actually the thing I was getting to with StarCraft 2. So StarCraft 2, like I said, they were they took out the restriction on selection of units and buildings they allowed you to so which meant you could control your buildings and have a single control group for all your production structures and then tap between them and build stuff without having to go back to your base and better shift queuing on a lot of the production but you still had queues you still if you spent resources on units that were not actively building and you can only build one at a time with the exception of the terran reactor and the warp gate you had you could only build one at a time which meant that you had to have enough buildings anyway. You still had enough buildings. Still queuing was a bad idea. It was still a waste of resources. In Immortal, they take it one step further. 
queuing is not a thing. So buildings, units building from buildings are built all at once. You can build up to the supply cap of the individual building. So there's a global supply cap that's just increased by building more of them, 16 at a time. And then each individual building provides 16 supply worth of production space for whatever units it can build. So for instance, Shadow Murloc can build 32 supply worth of Legion Hall units and 16 supply worth of Soul Foundry units at the same time, but can also only build 48 supply worth of units, period. So that's that's the that's the way it's kind of balanced out. Speaking of though, the Zephyr or the Dervish rather are a very strong Soul Foundry unit. 15 supply worth of them coming in here, taking out everything that's attacking, then not retreating. Forcing Santa Claus to waste Reign of Blood and Shadow Murloc lasts another day. Both of them getting into the third expansion at the same time. Shadow Murloc going for the counterattack. They know they can just go through all these masked hunters. Like the Dervish will rip the mass hunter to pieces. Got the splash, got the damage type advantage. It's all there. And the infuse on top of that, going for the red tithe to try to save some of them, does at least get rid of the dervishes before they all die. And that means Shadow Murloc, got to be more careful pushing this. They are still going for it. But with the calls coming in, Shadow Murloc realizes they got to cut their losses and get back to base. Doing so, anything else would be a loss of their army, which it's worth noting the way that the way this game tends to go, in terms of dynamics, is that you will have armies built quite quickly and frequently. Like I said, you can build your entire supply cap in parallel. Assuming you aren't picky about unit types. If you are, you can build based on the unit production stars you have. And, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa these Zakals are not facing the right units. Santa Claus losing two Zakal for 25 Pyre? That's... that might bite them. That is a that is a trade in Shadow Murloc's favor. Anyhow, the dynamic of the game is typically that you'll see a lot of building and rebuilding. Because it's very easy to rebuild in terms of supply cap and production. But building units still cost resources. They're still expensive. So if you do not have the resources to rebuild your army, you will fall behind in expansions. You will fall behind in supply, well, in production structure production, which means you'll fall behind in supply production. You'll fall behind in your army eventually because both you can't produce as much of it. You can't feel as much of it at a time. And then you go broke trying to rebuild over and over. So the main way players lose is that their army gets drained over time. They might, like, big hits in the base that destroy production structures or, or destroy expansions are actually very significant. But losing your entire army, like a full army wipe, you have one or two of those and you might not be able to recover depending on how many expansions you have. If you're well expanded, you have a decent amount of production structures, you'll be fine. If you're not well expanded and your production structure counts like four or five maybe of like 64 to 80 supply available you could very easily fall behind like yeah three expansions no you don't want to lose your army you really don't so that's how economy advantage becomes army advantage is if you can defeat the opponent's army and they keep trying to push into you or you can apply pressure successfully then that will do a lot of good. If you can't apply press successfully, then the game goes back to neutral. Which it effectively has. Shadow Murloc's still a little bit behind, but they've they've recovered reasonably well. They've gotten, they've gotten their armies roughly back up to the same value as Santa Claus. They've also built a hidden expansion over in the corner, which I think Santa Claus is wise. Yeah, they caught wise too. Hidden expansion in the corner, that is not gonna last. And some run buys as well, because Santa Claus does that, because Santa Claus is tricky. And Shadow Murloc. It's worth- they have- Ooh, okay, dropping the birthing- dropping the birthing storm. Gotta be careful here. That- yeah, that's kill. That's- ooh, that's gonna turn this around so fast. Every single time one of these Zephyrs die, Kittle spot. Oh man, this is a this is scrappy. Second shot over here to take out all the units coming out of the expansion, though. That's looking like a win for Shadow Murloc. But the fight out in the corner by the center expansion is not going so well for them. Which means these Zephyrs are probably not long for this world. But hey, get rid of some Zakal. Does a decent job. Save the expansion. At least for now. Sure, why not? 
Shadow Murloc, forced to rebuild, though. They are going to be delayed a fair bit. Again, having to rebuild your army delays you in tech, delays you in general, in army production. Oof. And, of course, Birthing Storm comes in as well. These Dread Sisters are just not making it easy. Never gets caught and killed by a root. Now, or is it, now with Orism's tools, there are some options. Hallowers come to mind. Hallowers really come to mind. Oh my goodness, why is there no House of Evading Saints? Oh, Shadow Murloc is Ether Starved. That would explain it. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually. Wait, why is. They could have built Ether here. I mean, the Hidden Expansion was definitely expensive. And then. I don't know. That's, uh... Honestly, the Hidden Expansions. The fact that the Hidden Expansion got caught and destroyed is. there. Like, it's. It, that's a. That's a significant. Significant problem here for Shadow Murloc. They... No, it's the reason why they're kind of... They're struggling at this point. Trying to take out Santa's expansion, but Santa... They're ready. They can easily take out this army. Like, Shadow Murloc's gotta be careful. And from here, it is... A... It is a push to get away! It's just... There's a race to run! Santa Claus missing with the route. Very least, the Zerfers have a chance to escape. They're, like, they desperately need to. A couple of them did go down to the Kittles, the Birthing Storm. But most of them escape. Santa Claus will not be able to wipe Shadow Murloc's army. If Shadow Murloc loses their army again without getting another expansion or two, they are... they are done. Like, this army needs to survive. Shadow Murloc getting Birthing Storm. They do have infuses, but there's just... only one infuse pops! More Birthing Storms are dropping on their forces, wiping them out piece by piece. Every single Zephyr loss to that is just that much more of a loss. Because it's kind of free. I mean, it's just, just mana. Just it, it rebuilds. It's, it's there. And then over to the north, we have the Mass Hunters with the run by and the harassment taking up this expansion once again. Santa Claus. Not... Are they flanking? Maybe. Not sure if they're flanking or setting up for the Ancient Kill. I think they're setting up for the Ancient Kill. Same time, Master Hunter's just in the main base. Taking out some moats. Taking out some other units. Not gonna do much besides what they've already done, but they've done a ton of damage. And now going for the Ancient, because why not? Yeah, Santa Claus turning their... Unit advantage into a pyre advantage. There's not a whole lot Shadow Murloc can do against this. They simply do not have the army value here. They especially not into here with all the siege moss in place. Yeah, let them let let Santa Claus walk out of there and put themselves in an awkward position to fight from. Then you can like get them as they come out. But even then, that birthing storm once again doing so much against these zephyrs, absolutely wiping them out. Now the, 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 the scepters are done. Shadow Murloc lost their army. Santa Claus pushing in for the kill. Hard to go with this as that. Yeah, this is... Rain of Blood. Santa Claus thinks this is it. Shadow Murloc fighting desperately to stay in. And they, they are up a game. So if they lose this, it's game three. It's not over. But they do lose this. It will be moving on to game three. But it is not over. It is, however, still a question of what Shadow Murloc wants as far as their map. Because they have map pick now. Oh, right. So, anyone who got a key, there's a Discord link in the chat. That is for the... Not my... I do not have a personal Discord, just to be clear. It is for the Discord for the game. Join that. There's a channel for the... There's a channel called Download Immortal. You get that thing there, and then you just get... You enter the key into the client. That's... That is how it works. As for units... Yeah, so you get units... <sighs> It's... Okay, how am I going to put this? 
you... Yeah, one city max supply without workers counting. Which means you get 80... So the current setup for Aru is like 80 basic Aru units. So essentially 80 Marines. Which is pretty close to Starcraft. Like, it's it's two... It's... When you consider how much... I mean, I think in Starcraft it's like 120 Marines is the max you could get. So yeah, 80 workers, 120 Marines would be roughly the equivalent. In this, like, 80 Masked Hunters or Bone Stalkers would be the maximum. Part of it is also that this is designed for 2v2 as well. The 160 supply cap is true for both per player. So in 2v2, it's 320 in total. And there's been talk about possibly raising it for 1v1 to 200 240. And it's... Uh, there's been no discussion beyond just the possibility being being floated. It's... Currently 160 for both, but yeah, bear in mind, 2v2 is also 160 each, which means 2v2 games, you get a significant increase in the number of units. Santa Claus cares not for that, though. They are going straight for the worker rush. And they're good at this, too. Shadow Murloc is going to have the work cut out for them actually defending this. And even if they do, Santa Claus knows how to recover. However, Shadow Murloc playing it pretty smart, going for the early Legion Hall, so defending this is not going to be too complicated. Santa Claus also being clever. I like that, but I think they got spotted. Uh, it's hard to say. Really hard to say. Yeah, they're clever with the teapot up front to make sure that the symbiotes are spotted. Or are not spotted, rather. Are completely missed. Shadow Murloc. I think they know what's up. The fact that they went for the early Legion Hall just off the top tells me they know what's up. Yeah, they, yeah, they know. Going to be pulling their moats. They are going to be pulling their moats. Don't want to let the Legion Hall die. The Legion Hall dies, the game is over. And now it's down a half. It's down to just health. And that might be a problem. Oof. Still saved the Legion Hall. Still saved... The Zentari. And now... Bone Stark is coming in from Santa Claus. Again, they recovered. Not a big problem. They lost a few moats. It did pull them back a little bit. They also have not expanded. And Shadow Morlock is well aware there are Bone Stalkers. Four Zentari against six Bone Stalkers? That's still gonna be advantage Shadow Murloc. It's down to what comes next. Shadow Murloc... Picking up some pyre. As best they can. Regrouping. Are they... They are getting a very quick soul foundry. Ooh, are they going to go for a dervish? They have... They're getting ether. I mean, they had to, to get the soul foundry in the first place. Man, what are they... Or how... Oh, no. Absolvers could be a really good choice. Absolvers would make a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, Absolvers and Tari into... Into a pillar push into Santa's main base. That would be... That would be so good. But the Dervish would also work too, just to get rid of the Bone Stalkers. Gotta be careful. Zentari are a bit weak. They will not be able to take this fight. Shadow Murloc knows it. Oh, with Infuse? Maybe. It's still gonna lose the Zentari if not careful, but... Infuse does mean the Bone Stalkers forced to run. Cannot run! Lose many of their number in the process. Half of them do go down. Zentari definitely win for keeping the army value up. Now, what's coming out of the Soul Foundry? It is going to be Dervish. Makes sense. I mean, Pillar as a point of attack is no longer relevant as Shadow Merlin just spent the pyre that would have gone for that. And, of course, Dervish are strong in this scenario. Multiple light units going up against. There's no sign of a Neurocyte. It's all Altar. It's all Bone Stalkers all day. And the expansion for Sen is up a little bit faster than Shadow Murloc. The units are not quite as immediately threatening. Of course, Shadow Murloc. Are they going for Pyre? I think they're just looking for Pyre. Are they, are they looking for if Santa's done anything tricksy? Because Santa is playing Zol. They can't go that tricksy with construction. 
Ooh, but there is the Bone Stalker coming in around the back for the run by. Are there any units under production? No, there aren't. This may turn the tables. Shadow Murloc. They are setting up for something, but yeah, again, they are... Gotta worry about stuff in the back lines. They don't have anything to defend. More Bone Stalkers coming from the front. Well, still, the moat's able to escape. Slows down mining, but no major losses. Problem, of course, is these Bone Stalkers here. Those are gonna be a problem. Shadow Murloc cluing in on that decides, you know what? Nope. Nope. Just gonna build units. Try to save it with units being built on site. Zephyrs are down. Or up, rather. Zephyrs are up. They are not going. Oh, not close enough. Centauri coming in here. The Zephyrs not able to save the Soul Foundry due to being a little out of range. And the expansion has been cancelled as well. Shadow Murloc turning that into... Wait, did it get cancelled? I think it just got killed. Not get... Really? With that... Oh. Okay. Well, at any rate, the Zentari over in, Sh in Santa's base are still causing issues. Now, honestly, it's a base race. Shadow Murloc has accepted this fact. It is a base race. Santa Claus, they're a little better prepared for this. They have symbiotes out and about. They could build a hidden expansion somewhere. Actually, so good, so good Shadow Murloc. This is the game at the moment. Santa Claus, they have to contend with Empire and Broken. Buying Shadow Murloc, precious time. As Santa Claus simply doesn't have the resources to build an expansion. Neither does Shadow Murloc, mind you. Oh no, Shadow Murloc, don't go for the, don't go for the Bastion. Or maybe go for the Bastion, actually. That won't, it'll stop hitting you. You gotta go for the you gotta go for the Grove Heart. You have to go for the Grove Heart. It's entirely a question of timing on the Grove Heart. It is not gonna be enough. Santa Claus is gonna take this just barely. Wait, what? They aren't! Acropolis in the third! Shadow Murloc barely saving a Santa Claus with defensive turrets to buy some time. That opens things back up for them to be able to recover. And Shadow Murloc throws in the towel. Santa Claus takes it with omnivores, of all things. To move on to fight Scruffy in the winner's finals. Sheesh. What a game. What a game. That was... Honestly, quite back and forth for a worker rush game. Like, not all those things off and go... People have gotten used to the worker rush, it's kind of the thing. Like, it, it's, it's become common enough that people kind of get it. Well, given that, it's going to be now the winner's finals. We are getting into... Oh, that was on the whole time. Yeah, we're getting to the winner's finals. It's going to be Scruffy versus Santa Claus. Eh. Yeah, Scruffy versus Santa Claus, and we are looking at a... We're looking at what might likely be a very, very tight Grand Finals. Or sorry, Grand Finals. Winner's Finals. We'll see about Grand Finals later. Winner's Finals is what we're looking at right now. Scruffy definitely has the advantage, I would say. Just an overall skill. But Santa Claus is a tricky player. Like, Santa Claus is not a player who does... Also, worth noting... There's a bit of chat about tea. This is not a teapot. This is just a water jug. <sighs> tea is nice. But, yeah. Wing condition is destroying the town hall. So, the wing condition for the game is if you destroy all town halls, you, you win. But, town halls under production count towards your number of town halls. Which is why, when Shadow Murloc made their third base Acropolis, they lived. If it weren't for all the defenses inside of Santa's base, Shadow Murloc would have taken it. Like, I can see why they went for the Bastion first, because that's... Eh? 
I, that is damaging them, but doing that bought San enough time to build the Omnivores. And also, just in general, San had the time and presence of mind to get the Omnivores, which, again, it saved them. So now we're into Scruffy and Santa for the winner's finals. Which will be up to Scruffy for map. All right, so resource, people are wondering about resource gather rates. It is about, I think, 600 alloy. Per okay, so here's a big, 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 big thing about Immortal that is not true of other games. One of the biggest things about Immortal is that they are not, they're pushing for a non exponential economy. Like, the economy is not meant to explode from tiny advantages, which is, again, one of those things that is. A learning curve smoother and also just kind of a balance smoother in all honesty <laughs> it's, it makes it a lot easier to make a reasonably balanced game when you don't have to worry about one player just going completely off the rails with their economy and their army and part of that is that you just don't get this much from bases I, I think I think the gather rate per base is I want to say six per second per moat, or is it one per second? No, it's one per second. Six per mineral line per moat, or ally line per moat. So it is, I believe, 360 alloy sec or a minute? No. Let me think. 3600 alloy bases drain in 15 minutes, which means... <sighs> Never do math on stream. Never do math on stream. People tell me to do. Ah, brain. Well, anyway, 3600 alloy does drain in about 15 minutes. So, yeah, it's something... It is something along the lines of 300-ish alloy a minute per base. Give or take. Yeah, because 360 would be 10. 300 be... Well, 12. Yeah, 300 makes about makes sense. See, I think it's 300... I think it's 300 alloy per base is what you get. Which means it's 5 per second for a full alloy line. Something along those lines. 300 to 360. Another way of looking at it is the main base takes about... No, it's 60 minutes. Yeah, no, that's right. Could be even lower, actually. Yeah, it's it's pretty low. Honestly, for a fully saturated base, for a fully upgraded base. And then it's 5 ether per second per extractor. So the economy is actually a lot slower than StarCraft. But you're also not rebuilding units as much, I find. Again, that's why rebuilding units is, is a thing that's kind of painful. Oh, right, that's why. I forgot. You start with two bases. The Bastion acts as an income generator as well. So the Bastion generates as much income as a main base, which is why your alloy income is actually... F which is why their alloy income is actually fine. Because it's you're starting with two bases, essentially. So yeah, it takes... Every minute or so, it's draining about... Three, even you can see here, it's a minute and a half. It's drained about 450. So it's 300 a minute in a base. Plus another 300 a minute from the Bastion. So start of the game at 600 a minute. Until about 60 minutes in when the Bastion stops giving you income. But at that point, you have two or three bases at least. And those will last for another four or five minutes before they drain. And then you'll still have more bases. So yeah, the game is designed around an economy that doesn't really explode. Part of it is that's very low money. Part of it is that because of the upgrade system limiting how much alloy you can mine at a beginning. It's like if you could only mine from a ha like a third of the mineral patches at the start. Like that's that's the way to think about it. Like imagine if you could mine from half of the mineral patches at the start of the game. Sorry, a third of the mineral patches for any new expansion and then you had to upgrade to two thirds and then the whole thing. That is what's happening. Which means that transferring workers from other bases or overbuilding workers 
which you can kind of do, but I'm not getting into that. If you overbuild workers and transfer them in Immortal, they don't do much until the base upgrades. So you're waiting, you're waiting two minutes from the start time you make a new base to the time it's fully operational, no matter what, no matter how many workers you have available to you. It takes 40 seconds for the upgrade and you have two of them. So the, the economy is smoother than basically any other strategy game. Honestly, that's the biggest thing I'd say it does when it comes to accessibility is that just you're, you don't have to worry about your opponent getting one extra base or one extra worker or getting a little bit better with their workers and running away with the game because they just drown you in money. Drowning you in money isn't really a thing in this game. Yeah, sorry, it's it's not really exponential in terms of time. I mean, I guess you could say exp exponential, but it's like or such a small exponent that it's effective. That's approximately linear. Because again, bases are cheaper, but you also want to you. So yes, you could get a bunch of bases, but then you die because you have no units to fight. But also, you can't just saturate bases immediately once they're built. As for this actual game, though, it may not matter, as it's coming down to Ors and Mirrors and Tari fights, which is basically going to come down to where the pillar goes, or if you're near a turret. Because Antari get the range when they're near Hallowed Ground, or in Hallowed Ground. So, with... With the Hallowed Ground in here, it'd be nice. <laughs> Pillow dropping down from Santa Claus. Going for the base. Does have the slight advantage briefly before Scruffy gets their own pillar. Santa Claus came with a little bit of a larger force here than Tari, but it's getting surrounded. And Santa Claus not focusing quite as well as Scruffy has been. They're able to recover, however. A little bit in here. Still 4v5. Santa Claus doing their best. But the pillar is just too much. Scruffy barely able to eke it out. Santa Claus pushback. Scruffy down, down to four Zantari against Santa's two. Santa continuing to find, looking to find some angle. Only able to have one Zantari escape to tell the tale of the grisly defeat of the rest of their brothers and sisters. I actually don't know if Zantari... No, it's a lore question. I don't know if Zantari are gender segregated. I'm assuming that they're... I'm assuming because I'm... It's just my automatic assumption that they are men and women. But I actually don't know. I, I would have to check that. It's a lore question. Huh. Well, maybe I'll remember to ask that after the stream. Anyway, was asked favorite unit. Favorite unit is... I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> Scruffy, though... God, they got that Zendar. They got the Zephyrus. So upside, they have a lot of focus fire damage without having to be close up and then hallow ground. Downside... Zephyrs don't deal as much damage as Antari do. Sort of makes up for the range thing. But we are back to normal. Scruffy is getting the third. Santa Claus is getting their third a little bit later. I think they're both aware of each other's expansions. Certainly Scruffy's aware of Santa's. So, that's the thing. Anyway, favorite unit would probably be... I want to say the Ichor. Like, the Ichor is a really fun unit to play around with and use. But I feel like at the moment, it's... there's. I'm not quite sure how you're supposed to... how to best use the Stabilize ability to create so, slow ground. The idea of that sounds great to me. Like, setting up a ring of slow ground that your opponent has to try to walk through while you're just... Pep, while you're just Hanging them down with resonance behind the I cores and that that sounds like a fun time to me, but yeah, I it's it's really it currently a little bit awkward to set up. I think once they add, I think it's more a matter of VFX. I think it's just like it's a little hard to tell how long it'll take for a stabilize to happen. And also my scouting minus don't be very good because it's a lot of pre prep, like knowing where your opponent's likely to go and then setting up in advance. 
which that maybe that just might be a skill issue, honestly. Ooh, whoa, okay, Santa Claus with the with the tower inside of their opponent's base. Or inside of their opponent's side plateau. This is always the dangerous thing on Lost Province when you're playing 1v1. That plateau in 2v2, there's another player there, but in 1v1, it's empty. And Santa Claus has the better surround, kind of. Scruffy, though, with the Zeph Zephyrs, doesn't really care about surrounds. Santa Claus, forced to retreat. Still able to hold on to their third, but not able to keep Pyre control. Scruffy has two pillars on deck, or Pillar and Infuse. Their Pyre count is terrifying right now. They got Pillar and Fuse Tower. They could drop Pillar and Fuse and Leia Tower all at the same time if they wanted to. Well, they're, look, they're motioning in a way that makes me think they want to use Pillar. And they do! Dropping the Pillar. Fuse drops for Santa Claus. Fuse as well for Scruffy. And when he left is the Tower, I guess. Pillar is not going to last long, but it's lasting long enough, giving Scruffy a significant advantage in the fight. And now Santa Claus, once again, forced to retreat. They may be losing their third base. Are the reinforcements coming in? Zephyrs are on the way in the Legion Hall by the third. What about the rest of it? More Zephyrs coming in around the side, around the back, maybe? Looking a little dire. Same time, Zentari over to the back from Santa Claus to harass a bit. So Scruffy can't get away with this for free, even if the base does go down. To be fair, Santa Claus is defending it well enough that the time may have been bought. See how this goes for Santa Claus. They are able to get rid of some enough of the Zephyrs, it looks like, to force Scruffy back. They routed Scruffy. Close call with moat help. By the way, moats deal... Workers in this game deal a significant amount of damage. If you're dealing with the single unit harassing your moat line, it can be worth it just to attack it with the moats or the symbiotes. Oftentimes, they will win. Like, oftentimes, the workers will win. Anyhow... Santa Claus with the defense, they are they can't push back. They don't have the army to do it. They lost a lot. They the Significant attrition in that defense. Their harassment, however, was at least something to give them a little bit more room to play with. Now with the Pyre Miner on their side, it's going to be a little bit more Pyre for them. A little bit of scouting as well. Of course, the tower there. I mean, it's not like Scruffy's going to go around the backside. I mean, why would they at this point? But again, Scruffy once again with more Pyre. They're up to another pillar. They nearly got it last time, and Santa Claus struggling to get a position that they can play with. Not struggling for bases, though. The other fourth coming up, same time as Scruffy. So the macro is still a dead heat. Santa Claus makes sure to scout out. And that's another thing to point out, is that this game... Now, it's not a unique thing. It's an Age of Empiresism more than anything. It is scout units. The teapots, the Utah teapot here, is a scout unit. That one's a special one you can buy to get detection. But you get them by default. You just, they just build over time for free. You only get two max. The, the flying ones that you have to pay for, you can get as many as you want. But you only get two max of the ground ones. But they're free. So you can use them just to keep an eye on things. Which is, to my mind, the biggest accessibility feature of the entire game. The fact that scouting is such a core mechanic means that the fear of here there be dragons just is way less prominent in this game than in general. So yeah, it's, again, it's not just this, but it is this. All right, Santa Claus having to contend with another pillar as Scruffy goes for the push. Third base is now on the opposite side. Scruffy between the third base and Santa's defenders. Goes to the windstep between them after the pillar is gone. Santa able to get the regen on the shields with the windstep, but only four of those Zephyrs remain. Scruffy with a whole army. Santa with only the reinforcements they can just now produce, and Scruffy pushing around the backside. Are they going to go to the main? Are they going into the main? Are they going to go direct for the third? They are not going to have a lot of fight to to deal with in the third. This might actually work. Certainly going to go for the third. And that third is not going to go down. 
Scruffy not worried about getting rid of the third. Worried much more about getting rid of the army. Which again makes sense. I mean it's expensive to reproduce the or to rebuild the army. Base likely to go down and does. It's taken out Scruffy able to escape. Oh wait, no, I speak too soon. Scruffy taking significant losses as they escape. Not even going for that, going for the regroup, getting the concave. Pushing Santa back. Santa, of course, does have their fourth, but that's in contrast to Scruffy, who has a third and a fourth. Santa's economy is now going to be significantly weaker. Are they building anything in tech? They have two Angelaria. They have the supply available. Do they have anything to support that? No, they do not. So, Scepters... Are the only Scepters and Sentinels are the only things they can build out of the Angelaria right now. Same time though, Scruffy, they're ready with Sharu. They can build those as soon as they want. They can only build two of them at the moment, but they can build them. They already have two. But they can build an additional two. Santa Claus. Dealing with two Sharu is a tall order. I'm not even sure if the expansion is a good idea right now. I mean, their opponent's army is significantly larger than theirs. Significantly larger. Plus the Tusharu. But yeah, it's like... You know, but... Twice as many Zephyrs and Zentari. Plus the Sharu! Natural expansion looks like they go down. Zentari wiping out the moats while the Acropolis is destroyed. Forcing Santa Claus to retreat. They are keeping some Centauri to attack a little bit, but their defenses from Scruffy are already there. And now the production structure is going down is the significant loss. Santa Claus, not sure what they have up their sleeves to try to deal with this. And neither do they, as Scruffy takes the first game. Alright, so we are moving on to game two with Santa Claus picking the map. They're probably going to be Lost Province because they... Actually, you know what? I don't know. Maybe maybe it will be. I, I know they like Lost Province, but they were just on Lost Province. Didn't really work out for them. But maybe they'll go again. Not unusual to try. Yep, they're going for it again. Alrighty. Lost Province it is. I'm certainly curious how this is going to pan out. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's Fool's Bay. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. I'm thinking they just lost on Lost Province. <laughs> I feel like they're more comfortable in Fool's Bay. So let's go. Oh, the giant ball things? They are intimidating. Bo yeah, the, the giant ball things are the Sharu. The Sharu are very intimidating. They have an ability that basically causes an entire section of the ground that how, it could spit about seven, eight light units in. To just be on fire. And everything inside it takes a ton of damage. And often dies. Like, it's... It's... It's as scary as it looks. Yeah, no, Biblically Accurate Angel is how Karoth is designed. Like, Biblically Accurate Angel... Yeah, I've, if... Have you seen Thrones yet? If you haven't seen Thrones yet... Oh, man, I hope I hope someone builds Thrones at some point. They're a little less popular than they used to be. Because Sharu kind of taken the role of the high-level... The high tech unit in 1v1 to go for. But I really hope we see thrones at some point because thrones are the biblically accurate angel. Like, yes, Sharu do fit kind of the wheels and the wheels description of. Oh, what was it? Orphanim, I think. But the thrones, they're not. They're basically seraphim. I know they're called thrones, which is a class of angel by medieval lore, but they basically look like. No, sorry, like cherubim. They have the four faces. They don't have the six wings. They look like cherubim. They look like biblically accurate cherubs. It's a it's as scary as it sounds. And the fact that I have that knowledge off the top, like off the dome like that is disconcerting to me. Why do I know this stuff? I don't know. I mean, it's kind of cool stuff, to be honest. Scruffy double expanding. 
I... Against Santa? That is brave. That is very brave. Santa did go for an early fast expansion. They hid their altars, building two of them for Bone Stalkers. Scruffy will probably see them. I am going to keep an eye on their expansions because they might be canceled as soon as the... As soon as the building production structures are spotted. No, Scruffy is still going for it. Santa is too. They're not canceling their expansion. That is a thing they've been known to do, is cancel their expansion to get units even faster in a way that tricks their opponent. Given that Scruffy did see the production structures, I expect that Santa didn't see the point. Like, this wasn't a pure deception play. 16 Bone Stalkers is still 16 Bone Stalkers, though. This is... Okay, it's getting up there. Nine so far, but, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. Same time, Mass Hunters are on the way. They are not quite up in time to defend completely, but they will be up in time to defend by the time enough Bone Stalkers come in to actually cause trouble. Both expansions are online for Scruffy. Santa Claus coming in to try to get the first one, but the Bone Stalkers are going to be contending with the Masked Hunters. And while the numbers for the Bone Stalkers are higher, the positioning for the Masked Hunters is massively favoring them. Scruffy with a concave coming in. Santa Claus looking to disrupt the concave. Managing to get a decent job, but at too much of a cost for their own forces. At least at first. Significant damage being dealt. Pull back Micro to avoid getting killed while able to take out the last few Masked Hunters. Santa Claus able to pull it back. Appropriately enough, with the pullback. And now Masked Hunters have to be rebuilt to try to take this on again. Another wave comes in, while at the same time, reinforcements from Santa Claus are streaming. Santa Claus with another full set of Bone Stalkers and Masked Hunters. Only four of them are currently on the field for Scruffy. This expansion over the front is extremely vulnerable. Nothing exists to defend it. The only saving grace is that there's a significant amount of HP. That the Bone Stalkers take a while to kill it. Giving the Masked Hunters time to come in. Symbiotes working desperately to defend as well. This Bloodwell on top of that. Wait, is that? Okay, Bloodwells need team colors. I want to say that's Santa's Bloodwell. No, it's it's not. It's oh, it's yeah. There we go. It's, it is Santa's Bloodwell. <laughs> Helped him out a bit. The expansion stays standing. Santa Claus. They definitely won a bit in the economy or the army game, but they are way behind in the economy game. Again. Expansion here, expansion here. Neither has upgraded yet. Largely because, you know, they had to rebuild their entire Mass Hunter line. Or rebuild eight Mass Hunters, that's expensive. But, you know, it's it's coming up. So for the time being, Santa and Scruffy are about even on economy, but Scruffy has way more room to grow. Santa, with all the Bone Stalkers, clearly looking to go for a big push. Three Alter Bone Stalker. This was a... This is a kind of a variation on an old Mala strategy, actually. It was three, three Alter Masked Hunters. Similar idea. Bone Stalkers are... Actually going to be a little bit stronger in the early game. Bone Stalkers are stronger in the early game, weaker in the mid game, and probably even in the late game. Depending on upgrades. Offering, offering Masked Hunters get a lot of our stock Bone Stalkers. But Ambush Bone Stalkers, when they have the extra range and the damage boost on their first hit are can kind of go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You have to still play them smart, but they can go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Infuse popping for Santa Claus, a little bit behind with the local value compared to the Omnivore, and that's that's down. Mass Hunters are still up. Infuse Bone Stalkers able to get the advantage they need. Of course, watch out for that tower. Santa Claus can only advance so much, but it's not enough for Scruffy to defend as the Bone Stalkers only take on the Mass Hunters as they need to. Their target is the expansion. They do not care about their opponent's army, except for Stopping them taking out the expansion. Mo more bone stalkers on the way. Is that a fourth legion hall? That is a fourth legion hall. We have four legion halls here. 64 supply worth of bone stalkers. We have 32 bone stalkers. Either in production or in Scruffy's base. Or on the way. There's a travel time. But yeah, 32 bone stalkers. Santa's just. Seeing what they can get with all the Bone Stalkers. Actually, it's currently like 28. Only 28. A few more on the way. I mean, that being said, Scruffy, they are defending pretty well. In terms of what they can build behind it. 
They're still getting ahead economically. That's a key thing. And the tower's coming through as well. I mean, Santa Claus is doing significant damage. They are slowing down Scruffy's construction, but they're losing a lot of Bone Stalkers in this particular pass. Oh, that tower. That tower coming up here for Scruffy. That is, too, that is putting in work. That is putting in significant work. Took out half of the Bone Stalkers. Like, with that tower support? Now Scruffy just trying to find the location to work with. And that will be... That'll be Scruffy. Are they going to take... They're going to take the lead? They're going to take the lead. They got the Bone Stalkers dead. There's more on the way, but again, Scruffy's economy is... Well, this expansion's a little bit hurt. But the one over the 12 o'clock, it's fine. Like, it's doing just fine. And more attacks coming in, more omnivores coming in. The turret tower's still doing its job. Santa Claus just can't break it. And Scruffy takes the game. Solid defensive play by Scruffy to hold the line on that one. And that means Scruffy moves on to the grand finals as the winner's side. While Santa Claus will be in the loser's finals, Flicky and Itlander are going to be going. I think they started, yeah, they started five minutes ago. That's going to be best of one. But because I need to wait for that, and also I think my cat needs me, I'm going to be taking a short break while we get ready for the loser's finals. After which point will be loser's finals, which is best of one, and then grand finals, which is, I believe, going to be best of five, with the caveat that the winner of the first... Actually, I'm not... Spockling's a bit of a wild card, to be honest. I'm not entirely sure where they're going to be coming in on this. A, is awarded a single win. So they have to win twice, the other person has to win three times. Well, guess we'll find out. We'll be back with that as soon as the losers' finals are up. So stay tuned. Actually, I'm not... Spockling's a bit of a...